Good afternoon, everyone. As Caleb introduced me, I'm Russell, and maybe a bit of a different background to a lot of people here. As a metallurgist, I haven't met any other metallurgists here so far, but pi was a really new thing to me um, going back about two years, and I've really just been amazed at how far our site has come and the things that I've learned and have learned what is possible. But today I'm going to talk about the delay accounting, which, uh, as Michael pointed out, is or could be called downtime accounting that we use on site. And really, this is about also about uh, RT Duet, which we've used to, to implement that product. So just to start, I'll give you an overview and some context on the Argyle Diamond Mine. And I'll talk a little bit about the OSI soft products that we're using there. Uh, then we'll sort of go into what we're trying to achieve with delay accounting and also the scope of the project which led us towards our new delay accounting system. Uh, and then finally we'll go over some sort of specific use case scenarios and sort of features that we're using and problems that we encountered and how we solved those problems or you know problems that still exist. So just to set everyone up, Argyle Diamond Mine was commissioned in 1985 and it's a pretty simple circuit. We have crushing, screening, dense media separation and then x-ray separation. It's not, not terribly complex and that makes it fairly easy to model but we also can't measure diamonds in the product inside the process right until the very end so that's a bit of a different way of sort of getting performance so we really have to go on things like our downtime to, to judge the performance of our plant. So the original capacity of the plant was 3 million tonnes a year and over time by using some really great technological innovations they've brought that up to 10 million tonnes and in its peak capacity it was producing about 40 million carats of diamonds a year so one of the biggest diamond resources on the planet. And also as many of you know, I've talked to a lot of the ladies out there, Pink Diamonds. Uh, Argo had a big win with that in the 90s, breaking away from De Beers and marketing their own product. So that's what we're really well known for. And then finally, in our future, we're sort of running out of diamonds in the open pit. So we're going deeper and deeper into the, the diamond pipe with our underground block cave. So that's presenting some new opportunities for us. Just a quick uh, flow through a few images. This is how we've progressed. This was the original Barramundi Gap where the pipe comes out in 1985. This is it now. We've moved about 150 million tonnes of uh, ore and about double that of, of waste. So we've made a significant impact there. And then this is the, what the block cave will look like. You can see there the white on the, is the actual ore body. And then the blue and the red lines underneath that is where we've dug our sub-level cave. So we're a fairly big operation. Um, OSI soft at Argo Diamonds was first put in in 2009 and it was sort of a little project about how to try and uh, achieve some efficiencies in the power plant. Key person left and the system sort of got sidelined and left on a, on a computer in the process control department. Uh, we picked that up when we found it was there we thought great you know we know Pi is a good product and we really want to build off, off that so it was a, just a great leverage for us to be able to go find a vendor and they say, yeah, we'd like pie, we've already got that. Um, and we just built off that. So we've slightly expanded our system. And now, in addition to using uh, AF for our delay accounting, as I'm going to describe to you next, we also have some really great uh, experiences building automated reports. You know, Two years ago, we were running SQL queries and taking 20 minutes sometimes to collect all the morning minutes uh, for the meeting, but now it's a 30 second job. So we're getting some impressive stuff there. Uh, so I won't, I won't spend too much time. I'm sure most of you understand why it's important to record delay accounting or downtime events. Um, more specifically, perhaps rather than just talking about your full plant stoppages, becoming more important are reductions in plant rate. So when you're not running at that optimum level, whereas previous downtime systems might not have caught that, 
And now we can sort of measure that aggregated difference between your peak capacity, so maybe that's 1,500 tonnes an hour, and a reduced rate, 1,000 tonnes an hour, and really quantify not what's just stopping the plant, but what's reducing its capacity. Um, and then final, obviously, a, the, a good part of any delay accounting system is attaching details to those events once you've measured them. So you need to attach things like what are the related equipment, what's the nature of the fault, is it mechanical, electrical or operational, um, perhaps the exact, exactly what happened as a, as a reason code, so did a pump bog, you know, did it need a gland repact, uh, was it an electrical malfunction. Um, and then finally, essential to most of these systems to do with asset metrics is a root category. So did this fault impact the availability of the plant? Did it impact the utilisation? And many sites have sort of different ways of doing this. And finally, comments. Most people don't like searching free text, but it's great to have more detail when you need it. Uh, looking at some benefits of what we get from downtime accounting, we have accurate data for our asset, asset metrics and as I was saying, the, the simplest asset metrics are plant availability and utilisation and people have been measuring those for ages in different ways but we can start getting a bit cleverer and then looking at things like net operating time and valuable operating time. Uh, look at reliability metrics like mean time between stoppage, mean time between failure, and really all use those numbers to give us a really great picture of what's happening yeah, in the reliability wise to the equipment in our plant. Um, once you have these numbers, you can focus your maintenance. You can do that on a long term or a short term basis. Um, and you can also identify opportunities. So one of the big things that even with old systems at Argyle, we've been able to use them to justify uh, capital spend. So you'll see something is costing you $5 million a year in lost production. Uh, it's going to cost you $2 million to buy a piece of new equipment and it will completely el eliminate that bottleneck. Put those numbers together on a CEA and you'll just stream straight through the system and you know, really no questions asked. And we've found that's one of the best benefits of delay accounting. Um, you can see that the graphic I've got up on screen there is actually the Rio Tinto uh, standard time metrics model and you can see up the top you're using calendar time, available time, utilised time and then operating time. This is a bit different to a, most other sites. But then you can see along from the right we have the actual categories of time. So things like scheduled loss on the right, unscheduled loss other, which is used to measure maintenance overruns, uh, unscheduled loss failures, a breakdown, and so on. And these things, the category you put an event in affects whether it reduces your plant's available time or its utilised time. Uh, I guess an important point to make before I go into the project's uh, scope is that this is not the first delay accounting system we've ever had on site. We used to have we had a legacy system that was built in the mid-90s and this was a, a sort of an innovative product at the time and it used SciTech P2B, MS Access and uh, Ellipse and CoreView as, you know, in combination to store its data. It did serve the plan really well for a long time and did what it was sort of originally scoped to do and it was, uh, had a fast front end, it was familiar to all the operators, we never had any sort of uh, complaints about the interface or anything like that and it was pretty stable, it sort of just ticked along in, in the background. So there were some good points but there was a lot of bad points. So what we found is that because it was developed by specific personnel who since left the business, no one on site actually had any idea, there was no documentation on the original philosophy behind why it was designed like it was and there was also no documentation on how to modify the system and change the system to do something different from what it was originally intended and that was really evident because in perhaps the 10 or 15 years since it was implemented the plan had changed significantly and it really didn't accurately reflect what we wanted it to do. So we, we needed a solution where that was configurable. Another thing that we had found is it actually had 
really poor data quality and this was to do with not being up to date so not including all the latest equipment so guys would be putting free text in their delays and free text is fine for a little bit but when you go to search that data you can't you know everyone loves their nice graphs and pivot tables and things like that but if you've got that free text one it's just going to stick out there and then you've got to go back into the system find it and redo it and that was a really tough process in the last delay system and finally, uh, small delays. This is a, a big issue for lots of systems is what do you do when, say, the operator can't respond to delays because they're appearing too fast? You know, alarms, like a chattering alarm, you can't deal with it and it's just going to annoy the operator. So we had plant periods where, say, a stockpile was going low to empty really regularly. Conveyors were stopping and starting and the operators would abandon the system because they would get 400 delays in a day and we really wanted to move away from a system that something that simple could be automated. So when I first arrived in 2010 as a graduate at Argyle Diamonds, it was one of the things that was originally put on my plate and I didn't know anything about it and the Metal East, metallurgy superintendent said have a go at this. This has been something that we've been trying to do for a while. And, but you have to do it on the cheap. We don't have any money. This was just coming out of the GFC. We wanted to do the system on you know, a, a fairly reasonable budget and something that would actually get approved from a capital expenditure um, point of view. We had to replace the system we had or sorry, not that, more review it and think about what we wanted to do. Did we want to replace it? Did we want to keep it? Um, but we, we did want to improve the quality of the delays and we did want to take advantage of the delays that we really knew were, were there. So, for example, we knew that other sites had delay accounting systems that automatically classified these delays and we really wanted to be on the same level playing field as the competition. So we're out there to investigate those options as well. Uh, so as a first part of the project, after doing a bit of research into our own system, we sort of looked out to see what was on the market. So we had a couple of options. We could stick with the existing system and try and change that. Um, we could go with an MS Excel solution and we had an, a sister site in Canada that was actually doing all their downtime accounting on Excel. And we thought it sounded dubious. We had a look. It actually worked really well, but it was a once again, it was one of those really unique solutions that was made, was made by one person and that was really, we were worried about we would be, in three or four years time, we might be in the same situation we were in then. So we also looked at Ampler and then we looked at RT Duet, which were two of the commercial options on the market. Um, but we eventually decided on RT Duet and one of the reasons we picked it initially was because that it was a really focused solution. All it did was delay accounting. That was its focus and that's what it wanted to be good at. So that made it a really uh, attractive proposition from value. So we were only paying for the delay accounting and not the extra product. So we sort of went, went with that direction. But we were also sold on the event frame. So the initial uh, high contacts we had really said you've got to look at this new event frames technology. This was sort of back at AF 2.1, 2.2. They said you, you will want to have a get involved because this is where it's going to be. So we could either go with an old technology that was a you know, pie batch sort of style uh, thing or we could go with the new event frame. So we took a, a bit of a leap because you know, it was the new thing and it it's, um, sort of t has turned out alright. So we also wanted to be with a, work with a partner that would give us continuous development and support. So we wanted them to ask us what we wanted and not just palm us off with, this is the product, deal with it. It's got limitations we know about. It. We wanted that, that attitude that that's a great idea. We'll build that into the software. So we really found that with RT Tech at the time and that was a really good sort of feed, having that feedback process and having those features actually come in in the new versions. Uh, and finally, we liked that the fact that there was all 
the features, the modular parts of the system were being built in. So you had web-based management of the delays, uh, web-based reporting being available. You had a flexible configuration that we could change on site. You didn't need to be an expert to sort of use it. And also we liked the validation. We didn't have validation in our old system and we think that really hurt our data quality. And then finally, there was that big one of auto-classifying delays. Um, I guess moving on to how we implemented the project, this is our Pi system but also our uh, RT Duet system on site. As you can see on the left there we've got a couple of SciTech IO servers feeding data across to uh, SciTech, uh, sorry, our Pi collector node and then that's interfacing this in our contr uh, process control department and it's interfacing with a Pi server and um, a web RT Duet web, web page server and AF server. Um, pretty stock standard sort of stuff. So that stuff's in our corp domain, but you can also see grayed out there is our, um, our desired redundant collector and that is only just getting installed now. So that was the solution to give us a bit more uh, reliability from our Pi data, which, well, I guess we didn't, we knew it would be an issue, but we thought we'd get around it at the time. And it's still sort of hanging out there as a bit of a bugbear for not having data occasionally when the Pi system goes down. Uh, I guess to talk about how the building uh, the delay accounting, it's really important to talk about, I guess, the tools that were provided by RT Tech. And one of them is the RT Duet Toolkit. And this is really, it's a front end for AF Explorer. And I'm not sure many of you have used it. It's got great features, but obviously in a niche solution like this, you don't need to access all the features. So this really pulled all the things that mattered out of AF and made it really easy to build a list of our assets uh, in, in a tree form and create our reason tree in the form that RT Duet required. Um, and it really, really was really useful. And I've got other metallurgists on site that when they want to make changes to the system, they can get in this tool and just create a new machine center or um, maybe not a change as big as that, but they can add new triggers to the delay accounting system, which is really good. Um, I guess then to sort of talk about building that tree, the, the idea of having the asset framework. It's not a whole asset framework, not like a lot of people have on site. Um, it's more of a machine center model. So we pick out the key parts of the Argyle Diamonds plant and the things that we want to measure. So as you can see here on screen, this is the plant. We've got a couple of crushers moving down into a, roll, a primary stockpile, a rolls crusher, and then we have um, a screening circuit, a uh, dense media separation circuit, and um, down the back we've got some more tertiary crushing. So we've got a few different important things that we want to measure. But if you can see on the next slide, the old system used to measure about 20 different parts of the plant that were all available via their status tags to be measured. And what we found is this was one of the causes behind having so many delays you didn't know what to do with, not only for the operators, but for, for the people analysing the data as well. We didn't have the people to analyse every part of the plant and make sure that data was good. So often you'd focus on one part of the process and everything else would actually turn out bad. So we decided in our uh, building our philosophy for delay accounting that during the process we'd compress the number and really get a, a small amount of high quality machine centres rather than every piece in the plant. And I think that's really played a big part in how well the systems worked because we're not trying to get ahead of ourselves in the thing. So that, that might come in the future, but at the moment it's, it's certainly working really well. Um, and you can see on the right hand side obviously that's a sort of an AF style tree of, of the machine centres with the um, sort of division at the top, then the site, then the area and then the machine centre. 
uh, I guess this graphic sort of shows you how we really compress those 20 modules down. We have, we're measuring the primary crusher there in the orange. We're measuring the main plant as a whole unit, just off the front feed-in weightometer, rather than all these little modules inside it. Because um, we can actually capture the things that really affect downtime. You know, we really just want to know what stops the plant or reduces the end capacity of the plant. We didn't need to measure each bit. Um, and then finally in the yellow there, there's HMS. So we had six dense media separation models, modules, all exactly the same. So we could build them all in parallel and, and just use the templates from each of them to sort of copy them across. This is the web interface. So a big part of it is how it's the majority of the users interact with it. So whether they're validating or it's the operator putting in the reasons that I was describing earlier for the delays. So what you can see here on the left hand side you can sort of filter by uh, the, the area so you narrow down to say one HMS module here. Um, you've got a visual uh, trend that's showing the plant state between a, a running, a secondary and a full primary downtime and then under the sort of uh, at the bottom of the page there, we can see a list of the events that are being generated by the system. Um, the operator is going to click one of the buttons, the little pen there, and he'll bring up, he or she will bring up an entry form where we're going through the tree, the reason tree that we've created. So um, I guess that brings us on to the first problem that we had. So originally we built this reason tree and it was, I guess it's kind of like a, an AF um, plant template. So you've got all your assets in your tree, uh, but we, we sort of used something, uh, the list of downtimes from our old, uh, old system. We used, crunched that back into an AF tree and then we, um, we went towards sort of just putting the, the I guess equipment codes in and you can see that there on the page. But the problem we had is that the guys couldn't identify, they could get the common ones but they wouldn't know what something like uh, CL1X01 is and I'm, well, I'm looking at that and I think oh, I, don't, I don't know what that is and I think it might be a cooling fan or something that's a fairly obscure piece of equipment. So we wanted to use our equipment database that the maintenance guys had and bring that into the system without having to manually rename everything. So as the guys before were talking about, that tables built into AF turned out to be a really effective solution. So what we could do is import our, uh, our equipment list from the Ellipse database and this got shut down so we actually pulled it out before it got shut down. We've gone to SAP now. but. You can see it's actually existing there inside as a static template at the moment, but I guess we'll change that. But we're creating a, a, a lookup, like a cross-reference to this table, and each element will reference based on its name um, to give it a more appropriate sort of description. So if you have a look here, you can see on the right-hand side how we're just doing a simple lookup from that table, and that really made a, a great impact to the guys just being able to look through that list, go, yep, that's what I want, you know, that's the fan, or, you know, that's the, scrub, um, the dust scrubber, and things that weren't apparent or weren't common pieces of equipment could now be more easily identified. A second problem we had, I guess, is trying to deal with common delays. So, as I said before, before we have sort of an automated think system set up, what happens when your plant is in that state where the same thing keeps happening? You're having a bad day with wet ore, the shoots keep blocking up, you want to put the delay down to wet ore type for block shoots, or the, the low stockpile that gives you 100 triggers for, for your event. So what we were finding is that every time the guys assigned that delay, they would have to click down five levels in this reason tree and find it. And that's probably okay if you're clicking down to the top one there, but if you're finding the equipment, 
and then clicking through and then finding it again, it gets a bit tedious. So something we use as an innovative solution, uh, we went into AF Explorer and we started exploring what references were. So obviously the original table was built with a strong reference, a parent-child reference, but going into the other referencing forms, looking at weak referencing, we found that we could create a shortcut in that tree to things that were buried right down in the fifth level. So as you can see here on the top, we have, uh, you only need two clicks for the operator to get to low stockpile or you know, high level in the, in the crusher discharge chamber, these things that occur every day on a regular basis just to make the, the operator interaction sort of a little easier for them just to make them accept the system. And I guess just to show that how the references work, if you look in the AF Explorer, we can see that in there in the right hand corner, you can see that this reference actually still has two paths. It has the original paths of the five levels and then it also has its reference path which is only two levels long. I guess I've already talked about validation but this I really feel I should reiterate it because having the ability to assign an attribute to that downtime event that it has been checked and has been okayed by someone who is knowledgeable and aware of plan events is a really big uh, plus for like a downtime solution rather than just having an operator who might be under pressure he might have spent he or she might have spent two hours attacking a breakdown and all those downtimes that were occurring while he, he or she was dealing with that event are going to have to be done from memory. So we found that validating the events to make sure they're right has produced a much better set of data quality for, uh, for our delay database. Uh, we also found that the blank delays that used to plague us in the past, if they're big, we could actually go back and fill them in, whereas the other system was uh, almost locked in stone at the end of the shift and uh, we had a lot of trouble doing that. And then you can see there we, we actually report on it every day um, how many of the delays were actually validated by, by the metallurgist on site. Uh, a really big benefit has been the really huge improvement in the reporting of our downtime on site. So when it was done before, it had to be sort of extracted because the reports didn't really work from the OSIS had to be extracted and tailored individually. Um, and now it's all done in Excel. So we use um, the Artiduit web service. And this is just a little tool that grabs the data out of PIAF, presents all the thing with all their attributes uh, available. And then we do some simple Excel manipulation, write some macros to refresh the page. And we've got an Excel report. So I'll just flick over the next slide. And here you can see we can do simple, like things like look at the time model. So you can see there on the left hand side we've got a pie chart of breakdown for the main plant head feed. You can see we've got about 70% uh, net operating time. That's good operating time. You've got performance losses there. You've got all the other, and then you've got all the other root categories sort of operating standbys, which are you know, obviously a waiting state, operating delays and breakdowns and then obviously the dreaded blank delay. Um, and then on the other side we can look at top five delays for the day um, or, or the month. And this is really useful in those uh, maintenance meetings. We can pop that up and say, are the things that are holding the plant out maintenance related? And if they are, the maintenance superintendent can jump on those issues and make sure that they are resolved so they don't appear in next week's list or you know, if they are a big issue, start allocating the money and the resources to start bringing those down in advance. Um, and it, like a, probably something I should point out that really had a huge effect within the management team in the process plant was the addition of um, dollar values to downtime events. So something that was requested was rather than time, what about if we use money 
to sort of, you know, the operators don't get how, why two hours of the plant being off is bad. So let's feed in things like rate and dollars per carat and uh, effective sort of full head feed rate and then we'll turn that, that hour value for a downtime event into a dollar value. So you can see there that the main downtime for that week um, gave us $500,000 worth of downtime and that really made, makes an impact and really um, energises people to get things done when they can see the end result. So that was actually really well done and that was another use of tables and attributes that we sort of uh, worked on in, in AF Explorer. Uh, down the bottom there, as you can see, each area of the plant has its assets metrics automatically calculated as well. Looking at sort of the current work, we're currently migrating to AF 2.4. We've just done that over the last week. And obviously we've seen a big increase in speed. Um, and now we're starting to investigate the use of automated delays. So we're looking at our alarm system, how we can hook our alarm system up to the product and start generating those automated reason codes, which we're really hopeful will reduce the amount of delays that the operator has to actually think about. So if we can get all those common delays, all the easy ones, then the operator might, you know, in the best case scenario, might only have to edit 10 to 20 percent of the total number of the delays. And, and that means that the ones they do edit should be of a much higher value and have a much more accurate sort of classification. Um, we're also looking at upstream and downstream classification. So if a machine up the circuit goes down and it takes the other ones down, we can feed the delay in that caused that so the guys don't have to classify three machine centres with the same reason. Um, and as I said, we were also trying to sort of shift what we'd done in Excel with some of the processing of the data into the event frame templates. So that's something that the contractors that I've been working with have really been showing me how to, what I thought was really clunky in Excel can be done really cleanly in uh, AF Explorer on the event frames just by modifying the template and making every event frame turn up with that. Uh, that attribute automatically. I guess probably some of the, like, the lessons learned and the, the challenges that we've had from the project. Um, I guess we've learned that you really need a stable system. Um, some, one of the issues, occasionally we have issues with speed. The operators really hate it when the corporate network gets overloaded and then all of a sudden that refresh that was taking two seconds to update the table was taking 10 seconds. It was fairly rare, but we really needed to work on how, how we linked up our settling. So we're actually investigating getting that uh, Pi AF server off the corporate network and back onto the process control network so we can get faster speeds. Um, we also found that putting it on the corp network meant that the corporate guys would often reset the servers on midnight for their updates and that's been a real nightmare. So trying to get what is a standard uh, sort of relaxed to apply because we're using their system for something a little bit different than they're sort of intending it for. Um, also we found out that I think we didn't do enough training um, of the operators when we first put the system in. People didn't understand why um, the delay system that we we created, we made a new system, we changed the model, was set up the way it was. So if I could do it again, I'd definitely be creating a training package and spending more time one-on-one -on -one with those operators that interact with the system and really um, trying to sort of get them on board. Because now a lot of them are on board, but it has taken a year to get that buy-in and for them to really see those reports and the vision that we're trying to achieve. Um, so perhaps if we had to spend a bit more time, we would the process of sort of getting them to fill in all the delays and, and also even help us with the process of, you know, every time if there was an error that it got reported or 
Um, so just that, that they felt more involved in the process. I guess there's my contact details if anyone wants to ask about it, but is there any questions? Have we got time for questions, Caleb? Any quick questions for Russell? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hi, uh, Vincent Ward, Art of Energy. Um, just a quick question on the, uh, said the analysis and validation, and you emphasised the importance of having a strong process. Mm -hmm. um, how helpful was the tool? Was it more that this is a manually driven, implemented compliance process, or was there any uh, advantages in, within the tool that helped deliver that? Uh, the tool has validation built into it as one of its key key parts. I, I believe that that's something that's a really common request. Um, so having that validation checkbox on each delay in the web page was a was always there from the start and you know that was one of the primary reasons why we picked up the product. Thank you. Thank you very much.